This is the BBC. For details of our complete range of programmes, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash podcasts. Welcome to the latest global news, compiling the early hours of Tuesday, the 9th of January. I'm Oliver Conway with a selection of highlights from across the BBC World Service. Coming up, nearly 200,000 people from El Salvador could face deportation from the US after their residency permits are cancelled. We'll hear from one of them. For me and my family, it's really devastating that the TPS will be ending. It's heartbroken because uh, we've been here more than 20 years. Also in the podcast, two major investors call on Apple to develop software to limit smartphone use by children. Rescue teams struggle to reach a burning oil tanker in the East China Sea amid fears of an environmental disaster. The actual condensate is a very explosive mixture. It's also very toxic, and so the potential for the entire cargo to end up in the ocean is fairly high. And later. We were at a cultural event in uh, Sochi, and uh, I think, I hope, we will be in 2022 at Olympics. Could ice climbing become an official sport at the Beijing Olympics? But first. Donald Trump! Shame on you! Donald Trump! Shame on you! Donald Trump! Protesters outside the White House demonstrating against the cancellation of U.S. residency permits for about 200,000 people from El Salvador. They were given temporary protective status, or TPS, after two major earthquakes in their homeland in 2001, and many have been living in America ever since. Activist Jaime Contreras said it was an outrageous decision by the Trump administration. It's time once and for all to give TPS holders a path to citizenship. These are people who have been living by the rules, getting background checks every 18 months, getting their fingerprints for more than 20 years. A lot of TPS holders have U.S. citizens. So today, I'm asking our TPS holder families and didn't vote in last election, come and vote in 2018, come and vote in 2020. Well, our correspondent in Washington, Gary O'Donoghue, told me why protected status was being revoked for people from El Salvador. Well, in a wider sense, of course, it's part of uh, the administration's attitude towards immigration generally. It wants to see immigration come down. Part of that is it wants to see people who have been here, who they would regard as having overstayed their welcome, to go home. So these temporary protection orders that were put in place for some countries, particularly where there'd been civil war or natural disasters, are seen by the administration as, in a sense, being misused if people are staying for, for significant amounts of time. In terms of El Salvador, these people go back to 2001, so they've been in the country 17 years, and uh, the Department, Department of Homeland Security says things are, have improved in El Salvador. There's been millions of dollars of aid sent to the country, and it's time for them either to go home or to try and regularise their immigration status here, which would mean applying for, for residencies such as, you know, like a green card or, or indeed citizenship. So they have until 2019, September next year, to, to do one of those two things. Yeah, how difficult is it to get uh, residency? I mean, they've been there, some of them, for, for nearly two decades. Could those ones just be forced to go home? Well, I mean, that's what critics of this move say, that this will break up families. They also say that you know, billions of dollars are sent from, from the US that keep economies like El Salvador going. The administration could be creating a, a problem in those countries if so many people were sent home without not generating that cash. But in terms of uh, their abilities now to, to, to get status here, well, the Salvadorians have been able to work with these TPS, uh, as have people from Nicaragua and other countries such as uh, Honduras. So they can demonstrate paying taxes, they can demonstrate residency here. Uh, if there's no criminal record, all those things will help if they want to regularise their statuses. But clearly it's a, a significant process to go through to try and become a citizen. Gary O'Donoghue in Washington. Well, Cecilia Martinez is a Salvadorian who came to the US at the age of 15. She's been living there under the temporary protected status for the past 16 years. She spoke to Tim Franks on NewsHour. For me and my family, it's really devastating that the TPS will be ending to the end the next 18 months. It is uh, heartbroken because uh, we've been here more than 20 years. And um, as we consider United States our home, it's true that it says that it's a temporary protection status, but 
we've been here more than 16 years. That is not temporary anymore. On a way, I but, think they should make a decision whether or not give us a green core or a path to a permanent residence in the United States. We are devastating, our hearts are broken, and we're just looking forward to see if we can stay on the United States legally. But just to be clear, you, you came after that earthquake in 2001, is that right? That is correct. Yeah, I mean, and f from what I understand, I hear you saying that you've now made your life in the United States, but the country has been repaired from that earthquake. It still has other problems, but El Salvador, you know, has, has moved on from that devastating earthquake 16, 17 years ago. That is what everyone is saying about El Salvador. But my country is not prepared to receive more than 240,000 families back to the country. It's not just because of the earthquake. It's the security for our children. El Salvador is being considered one of the most dangerous country in the world and the latest reviews. So how come they think all these children that they are US citizens and their mothers are gonna be deported, they're gonna be safe in El Salvador? It doesn't make sense to me and it doesn't make sense for any of the families that we are at risk to be sent back. Cecilia Martinez, a Salvadorian living in the United States. Next to an issue that parents have been wrestling with for years, how to limit their children's use of smartphones and tablets, with all the associated fears about mental health. But is it the responsibility of the big technology companies? Well, two large investors in Apple think it is, and they want the firm to develop the necessary software. My colleague Jonathan Blake explained exactly what these investors are asking for. Well, this is Yana Partners and a pension fund called the California State Teachers Retirement System. And together they hold about $2 billion worth of Apple stock. So a tiny percentage of Apple's total value, but they have hit upon a topical issue here. And they're raising something which for many is a pressing issue as we all spend more and more time on our devices. They've written a letter and it's published online in short saying that Apple needs to do more to help parents and children and teenagers themselves to limit the use of their smartphones. There are already apps which parents can use to limit the amount of time their children spend on their phones. What do these investors want Apple to do? They want to convene an expert committee, so from medical practitioners who've done research in this area, academics, others within the technology industry as well. They want Apple to do and commission more research themselves. But the main demand is for Apple to create new tools and options, as the investors call them. They use one example of the initial setup menu. So when you get a new phone, you can choose the language, you can choose the time zone. And at that stage, they say parents should be able to put in the age of the user and give age appropriate setup options, perhaps limiting the number of hours in 24 hours when the device can be connected to the internet or a mobile data network and to limit screen time itself. And is Apple likely to play ball here? I think it's possible that we will see Apple act. The group are appealing to Apple's financial bottom line as well as their social responsibility. They say that Apple can play a defining role in signalling to the industry that paying attention to this issue is both good for business and the right thing to do. There's been no response yet from Apple, but recently we have seen them, in contrast to the strict, almost secretive nature of the company under Steve Jobs, opening up a bit, admitting when they make mistakes, for example, recently about battery life issues. And Apple does like to present itself as an ethical, environmentally friendly, health conscious company. But they have to balance that between designing products and software that we want to use. And it's at the point now where our smartphones often distract us and dominate our lives to the extent that Apple needs to balance its social responsibilities with selling us products that people want, if not need, to use as much as possible. Jonathan Blake. The Chinese authorities have warned that an Iranian oil tanker, which has been burning for two days in the East China Sea, is in danger of exploding, sending its highly toxic cargo into the ocean. It's feared the 32 crew members who were on board the Sanchi when it collided with a cargo ship on Saturday are dead. Rescuers have recovered one body. Our science editor David Shukman reports on Chinese fears of an environmental disaster. In a broadcast on Chinese television, a presenter says the hazards are real. Mobile phone video shows the stricken tanker lying tilted to one side, huge flames leaping from its deck and a dark cloud rising on the wind. Given the scale of the fire, it's no surprise that many of the 32 crew are believed to be dead. 
Bad weather and poisonous fumes are making rescue efforts all the harder. The vessel was on its way from Iran to South Korea, transporting a form of oil known as condensate. This isn't the kind of thick crude familiar from other tanker accidents, but a much lighter sort of oil with its own dangers, according to Dr. Simon Boxall, an oceanographer from Southampton University. The actual condensate is a very explosive mixture. It's also very toxic, and so the potential for the entire cargo to end up in the ocean is fairly high. It's not an easy one to tackle. It's not like a normal oil spill from a, a tanker carrying normal crude, where it's moderately safe to try and deal with it. Here, it's a question of dealing with it at arm's length. If the emergency crews can't get close and all the cargo ends up pouring out, much of it would evaporate or be diluted in the ocean but the remainder could prove highly poisonous to marine life. On the other hand, if the fires spread, the condensate would eventually be burned off, which would pollute the air locally, but be unlikely to cause lasting environmental damage. Oil tankers have generally become much safer in recent decades, which makes this accident seem all the more shocking. And luckily, the wind is favourable at the moment, blowing the oil and the smoke away from the Chinese coast. Our science editor David Shookman. The autonomous region of Somaliland sees itself as very different from the rest of Somalia. It's declared independence, and even though this hasn't been recognised internationally, it aims to present itself as a functioning democracy worthy of outside support. Now it has something the rest of Somalia does not, a law against rape. In the past, rapists would be asked to marry their victims. Now they could face at least 30 years in prison, as Anne Soy reports. Somaliland's Speaker of Parliament, Bashe Mohamed Farah, told the BBC that cases of rape have been rising, but he hoped the new law would help stop that trend. Rape will now be treated as a crime rather than a cultural problem. Traditional mechanisms of resolving such cases have now been banned. They often favoured the perpetrator. The victim would be forced to marry the rapist, and their families would support such a resolution to hide the shame attached to rape. Most victims had no say until now. The new law has come after years of lobbying by children and women's rights advocates. Faiza Ali Yusuf of the Women's Agenda Forum told the BBC they've been waiting for such legislation for a very long time. The self-declared Republic of Somaliland is also keen to be seen internationally as a viable democracy with working systems. But implementing such a groundbreaking law is going to require a lot more than political will. And soy. Next month, the French government is planning to introduce legislation to expel illegal immigrants quicker and in bigger numbers. But in southern France, one new measure is already in force. A police border service aims to stop illegal immigrants from crossing France using the railways, with powers to search and make arrests on trains. The BBC's Chris Bockman has been out with a new service in southwest France. Well, I've just got onto the train and we're headed to a town called Bush. There's five police officers with me and they're about to carry out some controls and identity checks on the passengers. And they're going to try and see if there's anyone here who may be actually an illegal immigrant riding on this train. Merci, Merci vous passez une bonne journée. They move quickly through the train, asking for ID documents. Most acquiesce. A woman with a scruffy dog and foreign accent doesn't. She can't provide an address. She's lost her ID, but she does have a medical card with a social security number. A number of minutes pass as the police relay that data to their colleagues back at their command headquarters. The reply comes in, negative. She's a naturalized French citizen. Digilal, who doesn't want to give his second name, is one of the officers in the new force. The ID card of the, the people uh, we check. Uh, on our computer, we pass the name, the date of birth, OK? We uh, check if they have problem with the justice or not, or they have a problem with the administration, French administration. You have a uh, asyl? Uh, no, 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 no paper, nothing. Nothing, nothing. Okay, what's your name, please? 
Soon, another passenger becomes the focus of their attention, a young black man with a small rucksack and sports bag. He has no ID either and speaks no French. He says his name is Abu Bakr and that he's from Sierra Leone. He tells me that he crossed the Mediterranean from Libya to Italy and has ended up just wandering on France's trains. And, and why were you going to Osh? I never know where I'm going. I'm just, I'm just going. Abu Bakr is taken off the train and onto another one for Toulouse and a waiting police car to take him to headquarters where they'll decide what to do with him. Pascal Maillot is the prefect for the southwest region of France. It's his job to enforce the new crackdown on illegal immigrants in the region. And he says a specialized police force like this is essential. Obviously, the action we are taking against illegal immigration goes beyond just our borders and requires a lot of coordination with our neighbors. This is the role of this government with the national and border police. With this new brigade, we are adding another element in this mission against this type of criminality. Oui. Bonjour. But not everyone in the region is behind this stronger response. Michel Bosque works for a nationwide charity called CMAD, which advises migrants and those looking after them how to get residency papers and avoid expulsion. There is popular demand for everything. Uh, today there is there's such a state of um, political hysteria um, that, that actually many people, I hate to say it, but many people are ready for everything. They are ready uh, for accepting a reduction of their basic freedoms. Now, is it the job of a government and of the local authorities to meet such demands? The border police tell me that 30 illegal immigrants were arrested recently at Perpignan station in one swoop. But they also say that finding the traffickers bringing them into France is a much harder task and one which requires far more resources and time. Chris Botman reporting. This is Global News, the most important stories and the best interviews and on-the-spot reporting from the BBC World Service. If you miss any of the week's main events, you can always catch up with The World This Week, available to download from our website. The campaign against sexual harassment in Hollywood featured heavily in the Golden Globe Film Awards on Sunday. Perhaps the most stirring comments on the matter came from the TV megastar Oprah Winfrey. For too long, women have not been heard or believed if they dared to speak their truth to the power of those men. But their time is up. In fact, her speech on Sunday night was very well received, with some describing it as presidential. And that led to suggestions she should run for the White House in 2020, with Donald Trump being held up as an example of how a celebrity with no political experience can end up as commander-in-chief. I asked our U.S. analyst Anthony Zerka in Washington what he made of it. Well, I've heard a lot of political stump speeches. I, I know what goes in them. And this one sounded like a political campaign speech, and, and a good one at that. I mean, it had the personal touch. She started out with a story about watching uh, the Oscars as a child sitting on the linoleum floor of her Wisconsin home. It had a statement of purpose about uh, speaking truth to the powerful. It had a compelling anecdote about this woman, Ressie Taylor, who recently died, who was a civil rights activist, a victim uh, of uh, white supremacists when she was a child, uh, and then ended with a call to action and a slogan even, the idea that a new day is on the horizon and a brighter morning. I mean, you could just picture that being on a bumper sticker. So, I mean, there's a long time between now and 2020, but uh, that sounded like she was a floating a trial balloon to see what people would think about a possible Oprah for President campaign. Yeah, because the host of the Golden Globes also joked about it. I mean, what are the chances of a run? Well, I, as, as you mentioned, Donald Trump running, uh, I think, has put the seed in a lot of people's mind who wouldn't 
otherwise think about running for president, that if he can do it, well, they can. Oprah's longtime partner, Stedman Graham, was asked about it after the Golden Globes, and he, uh, he said, well, it was up to the American people, but Oprah would absolutely do it. There have been other reports that she's actively considering this, so the possibility is there. She has name recognition. She has gobs and gobs of money from last night, apparently is, uh, can deliver a message and deliver it clearly. I mean, those are the things you need to mount a compelling presidential campaign. So, you know, anything goes. Yeah, very good on TV too, of course. Mm -hmm. So if she runs, she will have to first become Democratic candidate and then obviously she will want to win. What are the chances of either of those? Well, you know, you have to sit here and think, okay, well, who could stop her among the Democratic field? And it's going to be a very big field. I think there are going to be a ton of people running. But, you know, big names who could match her, you know, toe-to-toe -to -toe as far as name recognition, you know, former Vice President Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, who put up a pretty compelling challenge against Hillary Clinton uh, in 2016, another possibility. Beyond that, the roster gets kind of thin. Maybe Elizabeth Warren, the senator from Massachusetts. There just aren't a number of really big names out there looming on the horizon the way Hillary Clinton was in 2016. Now, if she wins the Democratic nomination, going up against Donald Trump, I mean, who knows? That would be uncharted territory. But can you imagine what those debates would be like? Oprah v. Trump on the national stage in October 2020? I and mean, that would be, you know, gather your popcorn, uh, the, the likes of which we haven't seen in American politics. Yeah, wouldn't that be interesting? Anthony Zerka in Washington. Bangladesh has seen its lowest temperature since records began 70 years ago. There's concern about the impact of the cold on those with limited resources to cope. Jill McGivering reports. In the hot season, much of Bangladesh struggles to deal with intense heat, but the northwest is generally cooler, and now temperatures there have fallen to a new low, 2.6 degrees. Hospitals say they're seeing a surge in admissions. Some reports suggest as many as 12 people have died because of the cold, although local officials dispute this. It is a poor part of the country. Villagers only have basic shelter and use open fires or coal-fired stoves to keep warm. Thousands of blankets are being handed out too because many people don't even have warm clothes to wear. The Japanese government has announced plans to carry out the first ever survey of middle-aged hikikomori, people who refuse to leave their homes for six months or more. The authorities are concerned that many of these recluses depend on elderly parents to care for them. The details from Celia Hatton. Most researchers studying hikikomori have looked at teenage recluses, young people who, because of bullying or depression, simply refuse to leave their homes. But just as Japan is aging, the country's hikikomori are aging too. It's now thought that many of the country's half a million social hermits are actually middle-aged. So the new government study will cover more than 5,000 households who have individuals in their 40s and 50s who've completely withdrawn from society, many for more than seven years. Many recluses depend on their elderly parents to care for them, creating problems when the parents need care or they pass away, leaving their socially isolated children to fend for themselves. The Japanese media now regularly features stories of adult hikikomori who become destitute after their parents die because they lose their sole source of financial support. Celia Hatton. The Winter Olympics will be one of the year's biggest sporting spectaculars, featuring skiing, skating and bobsleigh. But there's one event that wants to join the party. Ice climbing was a demonstration sport at Sochi in 2014 and is hoping to be included fully in Beijing in 2022. As part of its campaign, it recently held a European Cup competition to attract new fans and competitors. Our correspondent Guy Delaunay went to see one of the events at Domžale in Slovenia. Ice climbing wants to be an Olympic sport and you can see the appeal. An artificial climbing wall like the one they set up here in Domžale could be set up in any Winter Olympic host city. Right in the city centre if you wanted to, bringing the winter sports to the people rather than the people having to go out to some fairly remote mountainous sites. We were as a cultural event in uh, Sochi and uh, I I think, I hope, we will be in 2022 at Olympics. Andrei Petsiak is vice president of the Ice Climbing Commission at the International Climbing and Mountaineering Federation. He says the sport is moving towards its goal of being part of the Beijing Winter Olympics. Partly we have already convinced them. You need a certain amount of countries, competitors, continents, and we are fulfilling that. 
It has to be attractive enough. I hope it is. Maybe we should make it a little bit faster. Are you finding that it's attracting a lot of younger competitors into ice climbing because it's the new thing, because there's opportunities? Yes, it started now. Mm. It has started. Last, last two or three years, you see there are many young climbers. Mm. There are many of them are 16, 17 years old and they're among the best. It has to be said, this is a pretty gripping spectacle to watch. At the moment, we've got the teenage competitor, Lucas Gertz, who's just skillfully got over an ice barrel suspended from the climbing wall, and he's now making his way up to the top with just under three minutes left on the clock to make it. Swiss sensation Lucas and his twin sister Sina are both double junior world champions and keen ambassadors for the sport. I think it's very spectacular because it would be the only sport where people go like upwards. Mm. <laughs> you can slip everywhere and so it's kind of tension there. Everyone has to be fit and climb fast and like do great moves. What would be your suggestions as to how the sport could develop in terms of its competitions, its presentation and reaching out to people? For example, yeah, we could try to bring the, the competitions more into cities maybe where you get spectators such as here, for example. That's a good example because some competitions, for example, in Italy are quite far away from any kind of civilization. <laughs> of course, the Olympics would be a great idea to develop it. Yeah, bravo, Mariane! Hey, Mariane! Whatever their ages, ice climbing seems to appeal to a certain kind of competitor. Many people here have a background in other extreme sports, from ski jumping to downhill mountain biking, or, in the case of Dutch climber Marianne van der Steen, short track speed skating. She says ice climbing poses a unique challenge. I train five days a week, mm -hmm. two times a day. There is a big mental part onto this training as well. You have to stay calm to be able to do the next move. You have to hold your body completely stable and still know that there is only 15 seconds left on the clock mm. to actually make it. But if you're going to do like reckless moves with your body, you'll fall off anyway and then you won't make it. So it's a combination of this mental status in, in together with the body that you have to develop. It all serves to make competitive ice climbing a potentially compelling spectator sport. Its promoters say that would make it a perfect addition to the Winter Games. After all, the Olympic movement's motto is Citius, Altius, Fortius, faster, higher, stronger. And ice climbing could be just the kind of Altius the occasion needs. That report from Slovenia by Guy Delaunay. And that's all from us for now, but an updated version of the Global News podcast will be available to download later. I'm Oliver Conway. Until next time, goodbye.